Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Adams Brothers Podcast. We are here live on Facebook today with the City of Deerfield Beach City Manager, Mr. David Santucci. We'd like to welcome him to the Adams Brothers Podcast, and he's going to be talking to us today about the budget, the 2023 uh, 2024 budget, I believe that's it's, it is, and he's going to be telling us what's in the budget and what's specifically in the budget for District Two. So, Mr. David Santucci, City Manager of Deerfield Beach, welcome to the Adams Brothers Podcast. Thank you, thank you both. I appreciate it, and thanks for having me on. Um, You're absolutely been- welcome. We are uh, we we know you have a tight schedule this evening, so we want to get on in and uh, you know just. Uh, let's get into the budget, and we'd like for you to just, like I just said, just tell the uh, viewers just watching right now um, what's in it, uh, the budget, and uh, if you could talk a little bit about what's specifically in the budget for District 2. Um, you could just, whatever you need to tell the viewers uh, that's that's informative, we're, they're all ears right now. Excellent. I, I appreciate it. And again, thanks for having me on, guys. Um, You're welcome. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, you know, anytime you're developing an annual budget, you, you can't do it in a vacuum. You want to make sure that you've got the input from the community, um, that I have the input from the commissioners who represent, obviously, their constituents, because that really drives the bus in terms of, of the level of service that we need to provide for the community and what the community expectations are. I mean, granted, we can never do it with and, and complete every project that we want to, just like you, just like me, there's thousand thousand things that I'd like to do. Um, but there's only so much money to go around. So balancing that is is always a challenge, but um, we continually try to prioritize, you know, based on what the community wants and what the community expectations are and what we need to provide a level of service that the community uh, anticipates and demands from us. So, you know, this year, I think we've done um, an amicable job at doing that and balancing those various competing priorities. Um, <clears throat> but specifically to your question is, is what does this budget really bring to District 2? And, um, you know, I think when you talk about projects, that's probably got the biggest impact for any community, what you can actually see, what you can actually touch. You know, those are the important things typically. And, and, and frankly, those are never the cheapest things either. Um, so we, we do that in, an, in a five-year capital improvement program. We program these capital expenses out over five years. And then we try to make sure that we can, we can um, you know, budget for those things in any given fiscal year. So for instance, <clears throat> this fiscal year, one of the big projects that's gonna be impacting every single resident uh, here in Deerfield Beach is what we call AMI, which is Advanced Metering Infrastructure. And that has to do with your water meter. So here we have um, very, you know, the technology has been around for a long time. We are frankly behind the eight ball, but I'm just glad that we're actually moving this project forward. It is, it is a metering infrastructure that provides real-time data to the city in terms of usage. And why is that important? Um, I can't tell you how many times we have heard from residents that say, um, my water bill went up last month by, you know, almost double. I have no idea why. And it turns out that they have a leak, maybe underground or a leaky faucet or a leaky toilet, whatever it may be. Um, this allows us to get ahead of that. And so that we can we can address the problem much sooner and help that resident to stop that issue, you know, immediately, not maybe immediately, but very soon, you know, get the plumber out there, resolve the issue. Um, <clears throat> so it's going to be a lot more accurate system. It's going to change the billing, the billing a, a little bit. So we'll be under a new billing system. It'll be a little bit more dynamic and user friendly. So we're really excited to roll that out. We're rolling that out in phases. Um, our public affairs and marketing team will be doing a campaign to alert residents of when those things will be occurring, um, the, the major kickoff. And then we'll have to be, um, we'll have to be a little bit more um, direct with communities in which that project will be happening when it will happen. Because we're going to go from community to community to roll that, that project out. 
but that's going to be that's obviously going to impact anybody with a water meter it's going to be a major improvement for for our water uh utility and we're looking forward to that one uh another water related uh, project. quick question mr manager not to cut you off but how long will that take uh approximately how long will that take to uh, get all of those smart meters in in the uh in in online i think it's going to be about a 12 month rollout uh -huh. um could be longer than that but for the individual resident it's it's going to happen within a day right. so it's not very it's not a huge impact to the individual resident um it will be in and out of communities fairly quickly as we as we move through the project and one other question while you're talking about water um we're also doing free chlorination right now with the over at the water plant if the community are, they're wondering why the water is smelling a little bleachy right now they're also doing free chlorination over at the water treatment plant correct that that is correct and that's something we do on an annual basis and that's precautionary for us you know here in south florida with our warm climate um it's important that you do that on an annual basis we make sure that we reach out to residents let them know that we're doing it um it is safe it is very safe uh, but for vulnerable populations um for instance people who are on dialysis um, people in ALFs, um, we know who those individuals are and we reach out to them individually. We contact every ALF and let them know that we're doing this so that they can be aware, but it's very safe and it's very common in, in many uh, in, in, in South Florida. Good information and go ahead with your presentation. Sure. Thank um, you. Yeah, absolutely. Stop me anytime if you guys got questions, I don't, I don't mind. Um, another project that, you know, I'm really happy to see uh, come to fruition that it's not gonna happen today, but we are funding it in the budget today. And it has to do with the Southeast 10th Street connector project. So as you're probably aware, FDOT will be connecting the highway system from the end of the Sawgrass Expressway to the I-95 interchange. And as part of that project, as they are you know, tearing up the, the underground uh, infrastructure, the first thing to realize is that as part of the project, our city commission really fought hard to make sure that they paid for all of the brand new utility infrastructure that would go underground that the city owns. So we're going to be getting brand new water, wastewater infrastructure along that corridor at FDOTs um, on their dime. And that, that's great to see. But nice. We're actually going to be able to do something that we have we don't have in the city today, which is bring reclaimed water into the city. And if you're not familiar with what reclaimed water is, it's also referred to as purple pipe. So if you go in other communities and you see these like large purple pipes sticking out of the ground or even purple sprinkler heads, that's all coming from reclaimed water. Now it's not potable, you can't drink it, but it's great for sources like irrigation and it's much, much cheaper. So as part of this project, we got FDOT um, to go in 50-50 with the city and install our first main trunk line for reclaimed water. That's and good. Add, yeah, it's, it's excellent. So we're really happy about that. You know, you won't see that at the residential level for quite some time. We'll have that main trunk line. We'll be able to branch out from there over time. But it's certainly a step in the right direction. And as we go through, you know, the years and years here and in the next decade, and water resources become, uh, you know, more scarcer, uh, more expensive. Uh, it's this is definitely a step in the, in the right direction for the city. So I'm really happy about that one. Um, there's some projects that are ongoing right now that that I think we should touch on. You know, first of all, it's the Braithwaite Center for Active Aging. If you haven't been by there, uh, the fence is down, which means they're getting close, and you can actually see the building now. Um, the Next to it, which is the Bezos Academy, which will be the uh, preschool run by the run by Bezos Academy. Again, free tuition, Montessori styled education for the community. I'm very excited about that one. And we're expecting that both of those facilities will be done around the December time frame. Um, admittedly, the uh, the goal line keeps on moving on us, unfortunately. But as you're probably aware, we, you know, we're still dealing with significant supply chain issues across the board. And so every time we have to wait on a material to be delivered, it unfortunately delays the project. But as of right now, we're hoping for December, potentially January um, for the grand opening of that project. And they're doing great over there. Uh, their numbers, you know, even with them working out of temporary facilities, they're doing a great job over there. They've got They've got lots of people coming to uh, regular classes. 
Um, they've got almost uh, 20 people that they are helping in the Alzheimer's Center um, at, at any given day. So really great stuff going on over there. Looking forward to that, that project getting completed. And another quick question before you go on, right across the street, that uh, the old East Water Treatment Plant, uh, what is that currently going uh, being used for? Is it still an old pumping station? Or what, are the, what plans do the city have to develop that area? And what are they planning on putting in that, that, that particular sp space over there? It's a great question. Um, you know, right now, it, it is the temporary parking for uh, the activities that are occurring over at the Braithway Center for Active Aging. Um, we did do a demolition project and, and took down some old buildings. Um, it was determined a while back in a master planning activity that we need to maintain storage tanks there, but it didn't need to be a, a, a pumping station and, and have some of the existing equipment and facilities that were there. So we, had, we went ahead and completed that project. Um, we've got some ideas of things that we can do there. And we think it might be a great place to perhaps do maybe some pop-up events, you know, food trucks, things like that real close to the community, lots of property. Um, it'll be right next to the new center for Braithway Center for Active Aging, um, <clears throat> things like that. So, so we've got some preliminary ideas of how to maybe use that on a temporary basis and bring the community together. Great. Yeah. Um, in the stormwater realm, look, flooding is not gonna get any better. I think we all have to realize that our water table is rising, meaning the water that's underground is rising because of sea level rise. And the storms that we're experiencing, I mean, just look at last night and the night before, they're getting heavier and heavier. Hurricanes are getting you know, stronger. Um, this is the reality. Um, so we are, we are headed in the right direction in terms of our stormwater master plan. We have four projects underway. The one that's underway in Deerfield Beach is the um, Martin Luther King Jr. Ave Stormwater Improvement Plan. Uh, we have a state appropriation to start with the design on that one. We're also looking at improvements in College Park. Um, those are the ones that are coming up, not talking about even the ones that we've already done. Um, but that is, is the number one priority in District 2 is the MLK area. We know it floods significantly. Also this year, not related to stormwater, but we're gonna be engaging the community in what they would like to see the MLK roadway be in the future. Because as it is today, we have, it's a four lane road. Um, it doesn't have a divided median. It's heavily tra trafficked by pedestrians, particularly uh, the elderly, right? Because of the, the, um, the, the, the facility that's right there in MLK, as well as an elementary school. And so we want to engage the community. We want to make it safer, but we want to hear from the community and get ideas of how we can do that and what they would like to see that to look like in the future. We have the funding for, uh, for that study activity, and we're hoping to get funding in the future for a permanent solution. So that will be happening as well on MLK coming up this year. Right. Let me interject one, one moment, Mr. Santucci, too, because uh, I remember years ago when that project came up and it was talk of uh, making that a two lane road for MLK. And there was a lot of pushback. I mean, a lot. And I was one of them. And uh, I would, I mean, I know you want to hear from the community, but I hope that I hope the uh, they're not talking about going back to a two lane because that was what we had in the seventies. And we totally outgrew two lanes over down MLK. North and south on North MLK. and south on MLK. And I just wanted to say that. So I, 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 I'll let you finish. It, it, and I, I appreciate that, but let's talk about how that happened, right? Mm -hmm. How much community engagement occurred before that went to the city commission, where at that meeting, I was there, where right. at that meeting, the public came out and, and, and the project got, got diverted to it, to what it is today. Now, mm -hmm. so, so two lessons there, right? Get the community engagement up front. Right. Let's make sure that by the time we're going to this to the commission, I mean, not everybody's going to agree on everything all the time. You know, right. there's 87, 87,000 residents in the city. We're all not going to agree all the time. But let's do that community engagement up front. Let's know what we're, we're presenting and let's know what the vibe is from the community as we're, we're bringing these these initiatives forward to the to the city. That's what's important to me. Um, and that's how we'll do it this time. Um, the other piece of that is, you know, what actually was constructed to me. 
is far less than what I think would have beautified that road. And I think there, there will be opportunities in the future to look at what we can do to do a better job. Uh, and again, the first, the first thing is to make that road safer. Um, we talked about the Braithway Center for Active Aging. I know the Kinger Center, it looks like not a whole lot has occurred, but what you probably don't know is that they're actually forming the walls on site. So this is a tilt wall construction. They're forming the walls on site and soon you're gonna see those walls go up and progress is gonna just happen pretty much within you know a couple of weeks and you're gonna see a substantial difference there. Um, that project is underway and let's just stay in the same vicinity there. We've got the, we've got the largest playground uh, in Deerfield Beach being built at Ovita McKeithen Recreational Complex right now. You know, the idea was to create a destination playground, something for the community, something that would draw the community in and make it a place where families can come with their kids and enjoy themselves. Um, with that, you know, we're, we're going to be removing the old playground. It, it has uh, some, some significant deficiencies in terms of safety. So we'll be pulling that one out when the new, as a new one comes up. Um, additionally, you've got the resurfacing, actually not resurfacing, complete refabrication of the, um, the court surface inside the gym. So uh, that's going to look great. I mean, if you remember, it had the old logo on it. We have um, refurbished that old court surface to the point where it, it just can no longer be done. So that's going to look fantastic. It's really going to complement the new Tinger Center project really well. Uh, so I'm excited, excited about that. You probably saw the basketball courts were recently resurfaced. Um, and so we've done, we've been doing a lot of that stuff throughout the entire city. Uh, and I think it looks, it looks fantastic. Speaking of um, the Tigna Center, I heard the speaker. Could you give us an update on the Tigna Center while you, while you, when you, while you're speaking of it? He did. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, he was saying that. the walls, yeah. they're going to put the walls up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My, I missed that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Um, let's talk about the fishing pier right now. Because uh, that's a current project that's going on. You know what's what it's not interesting, but what's coincidental on this one is that for fiscal year 23, we had budgeted for a full-scale assessment of the pier, because every time we've had um, damage to the pier as a result of storms, we're popping nails up out of the substructure, we're nailing them back in, and you can imagine what that does to wood over time. So we knew that we had issues that we had to address anyway. When Tropical Storm Nicole came through, forced our hand, we've done that full structural assessment. We've got the plans to put out the bid for that, the base bid, just to bring it back to what it looks like, what it looked like prior to the storm, but obviously with new infrastructure, new wood, new subsurface, some concrete restoration on the actual pilings. Um, it's gonna cost $3.5 million. Um, it's it's an expensive project and it's not going to be covered by FEMA because it was a tropical storm at the time and there wasn't enough damage in the entire county so that the county could claim uh, could get that FEMA claim. So how, with that, knowing that we're going to have to do the entire pier and it will be down for, for a substantial amount of time. Uh, I know right now the T's down, but we're going to have the entire pier down during the construction. We want to take this opportunity to see how we can enhance it how we can enhance it for our sightseers and how we can enhance it for our fishermen. So we've, we've, there's a survey out right now. You can go, I think you can still go out on our website um, and look at that. Uh, but we're really just kind of looking for your feedback on what we can do. A lot of the feedback that we've gotten so far is to add more shade structure, um, better furniture out there, you know, better um, places for people to sit, things like that, um, you know, more amenities for the fishermen. Uh, so we're looking at those options. We're going to go ahead and put this out to bid and, and then bring that back to the commission so they can make a final determination. But um, that is underway and that bid will be going out soon. Still going to have the underwater camera on site? Oh, yeah. I, I, I would imagine if we remove the underwater camera, um, <laughs> a lot of people would be upset. <laughs> so yeah, we will keep that camera for sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I love watching the underwater so, yeah, camera. So do I. It's very relaxing at night and, when you're trying to sleep too. And, and 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 while you're going over the pier, can you please touch on the uh, pier restaurant and just give us an update on on that and the things to come for that for the future? Sure. Sure. So 
Uh, beginning in November, um, construction and remodel will start to begin on the actual structure. Um, we're, the restaurant tour is expecting that they will reopen in May. The facility and the restaurant will be enhanced a little bit from the previous lease. Um, there were some things in the RFP that we wanted to explore. Uh, for instance, the use of the observation deck as restaurant space and awning structures over the outdoor patio, um, as well as the sale of alcohol to make it more uh, consistent with the other restaurants that are in the area. So um, looking forward to that. Um, we've had plenty of presentations on that. I'm not sure if we have the renderings um, still up on the website, but it looks like it's gonna be a really beautiful facility. Uh, I know the restaurateur is moving at light speed in order to try to get open as quickly as possible and uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, that looks like when it's all said and done. Right. Yeah. And do, you, and do you think we got the best possible deal out of with the Pier Restaurant? I think we got, I think we got a restaurant that most, that mostly understood what the commission's vision of what they wanted that restaurant to be, okay. you know, and I think that that's the, the important thing. So, um, the, you know, we, we worked with the commission up front. We said, you know, let's, let's look at, let's explore some of these options, the three that I just kind of talked about. Um, but other than that, you know, it, it was, it was still, they wanted, you know, to be family friendly. They wanted it to be um, at price points that could be affordable across the board. So I think the fact that they had various menu options, the grab and go component was very important. I think this restaurant tour hit on that more than others. Um, but ultimately we, we brought two options to the city commission and, um, and, and it, was, it was ultimately up to them to, to, uh, to make that decision. But if you listen to the feedback at the end of the day, the consistent, um, the consistent thing said was that restaurant really matched what the vision of the commission was in terms of what that restaurant should be. All right. Update on the Pioneer Grove area and how right. much will you uh, approximately be spending over in the Pioneer Grove area? Oh, uh, Pioneer Grove right now, the, the thing that we're going to be doing coming up this fiscal year, and I don't think I have a dollar figure for you, but we need to master plan that area, okay? We need to, and by master planning, that means determining with the community and, and experts what we can do there. So we're hoping to bring in um, the, the ULI, we've worked with them in the past, so that they can come in and through community engagement, you probably remember that we were over, um, right. we had a session with them over actually in the gym, over at Obi and McKeithen, where we brought up storyboards, we got community input, and it really helped us with their, their some of the master planning that we've done for the Dixie Highway Corridor. Right. Um, so to, what I like about that is it's engaging, you know, um, they don't just sit there in a vacuum, they get ideas, they go out in the community, they ask business owners, so on and so forth. So we're gonna start there. And then we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at probably going out for um, some sort of competitive solicitation um, in a P3 type of atmosphere or arrangement that um, we can do something to, to look at all the city facilities that we have in the area. I and mean, we have to do something with the police station. Um, I think Pioneer uh, Park itself is underutilized. Um, uh, the city hall space, we've, we're running out of space in city hall. It's, a, it's an antiquated building. So all these things will be looked at. And then how do you activate it, right, with commercial and residential as well, this area, to bring about a real downtown feel. So that's what we're really focused on. Um, that's going to start in uh, just after the new year. We'll start down that road. Um, but anytime you're dealing with these large scale economic development projects, it takes years and years. I mean, Look at the Braithway Center for Active Aging and um, <clears throat> the Tigner Center. That was a bond from 2018. You're now seeing construction. We're getting to completion within the next year, year and a half on these things. So it does take a while, um, but we are moving forward. A lot of times you don't see what's happening, um, you know, but, but things are happening. Right. Have, have they ever tried to develop that, that Piney Grove area before? Have that ever been attempted before? Um, no, not at this level. I mean, the first okay. thing that we did is we did a zoning. We did a, a new zoning for that area. Mm -hmm. So we did what's called a local activity center zoning. 
-hmm. And then basically that provides the foundation, if you will, to allow for development. But then if you're going to allow for that type of development, you have to build the infrastructure. Because how are you going to put larger buildings in that area if they don't have the water and sewer connections that will support that type of development? So that's a project that's happening right now too. We're working on the Pioneer Grove uh, streetscape and undergrounding project, underground utility project. So we got to build the infrastructure. Right. Like I said, you know, some people will say that, you know, it failed. It hasn't failed. It's moving forward. Um, it's, it's, taking, it's taking longer than I think all of us would like, but we've got certain things we have to do if we're going to see that the type of downtown development that we would we'd like to imagine that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We, we, we certainly uh, understand the underground utilities and all of that stuff. So uh, uh, that's good information there. Um, uh, we know you have another uh, engagement to get to. So let's get to ex- any, any more thing, any more projects well, you yeah. had, anything, anything else? Anything you else? Tell yeah, us we'll let you finish. Uh, if you had anything I else, mean, we, we touched on, we touched on um, what, what's happening, you know, within the parks a little bit. You know, Dixie Highway, we did, we talked a little bit about the ULI study. Um, We are moving forward with uh, more more rezoning based on what the ULI came back to us on. You know, the the hard part there is that, you know, we're going to need property owners to come to the table in order to see redevelopment along Dixie Highway. Um, It's not like the parcel there next to um, on the corner of FAU Research Boulevard and 10th Street, you know, there the city was able to do in one year what the Florida Atlantic Research and Development Authority wasn't able to do in over, you know, well over a decade. So um, that's going to be a great project for the community, by the way. Um, You want to talk about uh, impact, you know, you're talking about a a project that is going to bring, uh, and and I'm just going to get ahead of you a little bit here. I hope you don't mind. You're going to ask me about it. You're probably going to ask me about an amphitheater because we talked at the event that happened <laughs> yeah. over at Mayo Howard. Right. Um, we sat down for a long time, talked about that. We did. Um, yep. And 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 as you know, it's about where can we where can we put that thing? You know, where where are we going to put that put that amphitheater? And that that's the challenge. But over at 1045 Southwest 11th Way, that project is going to include a rooftop public park. And what the developer wants is for the public to use that park. And they want to host movies in the park, you know, a jazz night, you know, concert series, these sorts of things. So I can't get you an amphitheater right now, but I've got a premier rooftop location that's going to provide these types of entertainment and cultural activities to the community, which I think is kind of close to where you guys are. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's good. That was going to be one of my questions about the amphitheater. And we want that type of entertainment, uh, just like the pop-up, the pop-up uh, show that we did over here at Mayo Howard here about a month ago. Great event. Great event. <laughs> the only thing is it was just Beyonce was here. And I think Beyonce trumped all of that. You and know, Shy and, and Shy, someone else. We talked about it out there. But, yeah. you know, it was a good, uh, uh, successful event that you all put on. And we thank you. And we want more of that. Yes. Over in District 2. And um, anything else that you would like to tell us specifically uh, about uh, District 2? What's for District 2 in this budget? Yeah, let us let me let me recognize that we have really been struggling with streetlights. Streetlights have been a huge challenge for us. Theft. Um, theft has a lot to do with it. A lot of people think, oh, the, you know, we got a street light out. You got to change a bulb. No, we're talking about a lot of times either stolen conduit, corroded conduit. Um, it's old infrastructure. So we are looking to convert all of the um, all of the lights on our major arterial roads that are FDOT. So you're talking like 10th Street, uh, Federal, Dixie, these roads, looking to convert those all at once to LED through an FPNL program. Um, so I think that'll be a major enhancement for, for pedestrians, bike, bicyclists, uh, and, and uh, motor vehicles as well. So, and it will look better. Yes. That's good. You, since you mentioned street lights, I came down federal last night. I mean, every light was out on federal from uh, north all the way to probably past 
uh, at least 15th Street. I never saw that before, ever, since I've been living there. Not all the lights. Uh, maybe it was because of the lightning. I mean, the bad storm that was there. But every light was out around 9.30 or 9.40 last night during that bad storm that we had. Uh, so I don't know if that was attributed to the theft or or whatever else, you know, the storm. Yeah, uh, we might have. It might have hit a transformer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm obviously in the area area tonight um, here at City Hall, so I'll be here late enough to go check that out and see what's going on, and I'll try to try to push the envelope on that one. So thanks okay. for reporting that in. Yeah, M Mr. Santucci, uh, could you we, let's talk a little bit about pre prom, and we would like for you to tell our viewers because that obviously that was a hot topic when. Uh, the community heard about, you know, the city might not want to fund pre-prom again. So first of first and foremost, could you tell our viewers and the, the community and the city how the city got involved with um, the prom festivities that they have every year on the pre-prom? Yeah, I mean, so let, let's let's talk about that. I'm glad you asked that question. And it's not an easy it's not an easy discussion. It is my understanding that pre-prom used to be held at Deerfield Beach High School, supported by Deerfield Beach High School, right? Not every, not every high school does a pre-prom. Um, the schools that did, at some point down the road, the schools said, no more. We're not going to do this. We're not going to support this. So like many things, um, it came to the city, right? And when I say many things, there's plenty of examples of the school board skirting their responsibility um, for certain things, crossing guards, school resource officers. And these are all things that cities are, are required, you know, not required, uh, that the cities have had to fund because the school board uh, hasn't taken the responsibility to do so. I'm just going to be frank and honest with you. Right. So you've got you've got the school board who or or the school itself. I, I don't know. My understanding is that somewhere along the way, they were no longer going to fund this. The city took it in, right? So then the city started to do it at a city facility. Well, we can no longer do it at a city facility. We moved it out to quiet waters. So now you've got a school function that's occurring, not even at a, at a, at a city facility. It's happening at a county facility. And so I'll be honest, it's not that we're not supporting it because we're gonna support it. We're gonna provide you know, the soft costs that we need. You got the location to do it. School has the location to do it. The county has historically not charged for the location. We're just asking the school to participate. We're asking for them to be partners like we and the county are being partners in this. So that's really all we're asking. Well, so maybe we're asking, we can get someone from the school board to come on the podcast and discuss you know, helping the city, you know, with the funding as well, because it started out as a, a, a school board, a county a school board county event. So, uh, and and the city of Deerfield just, you know, came on to help out a little bit. And now from what I'm understanding, it's a, it became a city event. That That's correct. So we want to work with um, the school directly and see how, how we can kind of partner and divvy up the responsibility to ensure that it, it's still an event that occurs and, and we're willing to do our part. We're willing to do our part. Right. And we, we got some questions uh, in, in the comment section. Uh, Tyrone, uh, Hills. Tyrone Hills, uh, they, they want to know, let's let's talk about affordable housing for senior citizens in Deerfield Beach. And Liz Moore said, are there any plans for building affordable housing in Deerfield Beach? So could you uh, speak a little bit about that? And I, I, I think I remember, if I'm not mistaken, about um, when when the new buildings were up that there were they were asking uh build the uh, the uh contractor to put so many units in there uh, to be affordable housing maybe i'm off a little bit but could you explain it yeah yeah so well first and foremost it's happening right now you go down dixie highway head towards pompano you're going to see two one development going on um it's uh, might be about a six or seven story building that is a Broward County Housing Authority project that the city participated in the approval of. Um, and we vouched for the project with their with their um, with their their creditors and their lenders in order to make that happen. 
it is going to be a 55 and older affordable housing property for seniors that is going to be extremely affordable in terms of today's market rent. Uh, they were talking about like a third, maybe more. I don't want to give you the exact number because I can't remember what right, they said. Right, I was at the right. groundbreaking. Right. Um, but that's a, that's that's a project specifically for the seniors. Okay. And then right behind it, um, those are going to be those are going to be affordable housing for families. So we've got that project happening in the city right now. Look, we're going to need more affordable housing. We've got um, Habitat for Humanity, who has come to the city. I think they have six or seven projects that they're working on. Um, we're actually, as a city, going to be participating in, in one in January. We're going to help do a build. Um, and they're coming to us. They want to do townhomes as well in this community. And so we recognize that affordable housing is extremely important. It's 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 really, really needed. Right. Um, and we're trying to do what we can to to help and partner with with affordable housing um, experts and builders uh, to bring that to us. Right. Yeah. And that's been a hot topic that we've gotten a lot of calls on it uh, today and throughout the week about uh, please ask the city manager about affordable housing here in Deerfield Beach, because we all know that it's becoming unaffordable to live here in Florida, South Florida. Uh, just all over. I mean, everything has gone up. Uh, the prices prices of homes have skyrocketed. Rental properties, everything, and it's just the people that's living on fixed income. It's it's just getting maybe uh, their social security. It's tough on them, and so they've been pretty much begging us to ask about the affordable affordable housing. So um, yeah, when we how how could they when we find out more about the affordable housing. Will that be posted on the uh, city of Deerfield Beach website or could you all, I'm pretty sure Rebecca would email it to us and we'll go ahead and share it with our audience, but where could they find out more about the affordable house applications and, applications and, all. and whatnot. So that would be through, and I think you've had him on before our, our community services yeah. director, Jonathan Salas. Yeah. Yes, so, yes. 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 Yeah. So all of that goes through his department. Um, and he does not only can he help with, with that, but remember, We've got programs to help subsidize uh, first-time home buyers and home repair programs uh, and, and other things that, that can help people with their homes and to attain home ownership. Okay. And, and I know you got to get out of here, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, I, got, I got one last question for you because I know your time is limited. Uh, can you give us an update on the building renaming uh, for my dad, because I haven't heard anything else about that since maybe March. I think it was around March when it was, I think, first brought up. But I haven't. The, we're in the family. Everyone's out of state been calling, you know, just inquiring. So wanting to be here, wanting to, to come and be present when yeah. the building is named after our father. Bernard Adams. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I apologize for the delay that came up kind of mid-year. We really didn't have the funding for that, so we we needed to wait until uh, the new funding came about so we can go ahead and, and place the order for the new signage. Um, well, I'll follow up with with the two of you. Want to make sure we 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 do it right and um, make sure that you know what we're doing and 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 things like that that we're, we we put it upright and and so on and so forth. So right, okay, um, yeah, we'll get with you guys and uh, make sure you participate in that. Oh, no Anything doubt. Anything else you want, Wayne, before I uh, close That's all. I, I thank you for for coming on. Uh, right, right. We really Dave. do. Um, we know you have a tight schedule, and uh, we can't keep the city manager on here all, all night. He has another uh, a place to be in the city by 7 p.m., so we want to thank the city of Deerfield Beach city manager, Mr. David Santucci, for coming on the uh, Adams Brothers podcast and uh, answering the, some of the questions that uh, people here in our district two have uh, for you and the city. And uh, I think we just touched about touch on just about as much as we can. I wish we had more minutes. time, a little we, bit more time, but we we'll take what we have. Time, but uh, we'll uh, try and get you back on, you know, later on down the line here for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and maybe you'll have some updates for us. So 
Again, thank you, uh, City of Deerfield Beach City Manager, for stopping back. by and talking to the Adams Brothers Podcast. You have a wonderful staff, David Hunt, Mr. Rebecca Medina. Everyone. They are underpaid. You need to give them some <laughs> more money, find some money in the budget to give these two individuals. Because they some sure money. help us on yeah. this podcast. They're great definitely. for the community, too. That's uh, right. So thank you, Rebecca and David Hunt. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the mayor and the commissioners. Thank you all, and we look forward to having you back on our podcast here in the future. And we look forward to all the meetings, all the all the uh, meetings on on MLK, everything. We just look forward to everything. I, I think Deerfield uh, is rising. Yes, we'll make sure we put up. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and have a good evening. See have you. a good evening. <laughs>